Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, tell your roomie to upgrade that monitor. GeForce GTX 560 Ti to win. Puget Serenity brings near silence. Water coolers are back, baby. The Zenbook feels good. X-Plane upgrades, prepping for Ivy Bridge, and hardware for Unraid. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 145, recorded November 10th, 2011. GPUs, Zenbooks, and silent PCs. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. And by Ford, featuring voice-activated sync AppLink. Now you can control select smartphone apps with your voice, so you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Check it out in the 2012 Ford Fiesta at Ford.com slash technology. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another fine blended edition of Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. My name is Patrick Norton, joined as always by the inimitable, the indomitable, and the uh, actually not sunburned, and I believe at home, Ryan Shrout. How are you, sir? <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. I'm not sunburned. Uh, we did have snow just about 20 minutes ago, which was kind of depressing. Excuse me? <laughs> it's October. You're in Kentucky. You have snow. It's November. Uh, that's a good point. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we, yeah, we get snow. Sometimes you know, I mean, it, was, it was like just barely, just enough that it was like on the back of my truck. And when I came out from eating dinner, I cursed at it and then got back in the truck. <laughs> I, I got to say, even with the Darth Vader HEPA filter, I still feel like I swallowed half my house. And I would like to point out that I was using the, the super high-end HEPA filter for my face while I was redoing stuff. Uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit later in the show. Uh, we've talked about Ultrabooks. We've talked about Zen books, but I actually have one inside of Ooh. this sophisticated envelope. I'm jealous. Uh, the CTO of Revision 3 does not know I have this. So, <laughs> Oops. If a... Uh, if we could keep that, to, if we keep that just amongst us, this would right. be great. Keep yeah. it out of the chat room. You never know when he's in the chat room. <laughs> so if, yeah, if a, if a large angry man with a shaved head comes in here and grabs that, you'll know it was Rob or CTO. It's been an interesting week for technology. Not a huge week, right? Um, no. It's 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 actually some fun stuff going on. Should we start out? You know, there's announcements coming next week that you know you can go to PCPer.com or Techzilla to find out about some shiny new hardware that we can't talk about yet. You've got right. one of my favorite um, home theater ma PC manufacturers, uh, Puget Systems. Uh, one of their boxes in. Should we start with the EVGA GeForce GTX 560 Ti2 Win, which is just an awfully long name for a graphics card? <laughs> yeah, not only is it an awful name, I just. Maybe awfully there's people long. out there I that think differently awful. than me. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, the the two-win moniker, in my view, is not, like, I guess I'm not cool enough to want that in my system. But uh, re regardless the of the name, right? right. <laughs> regardless of the name, it, it's a good product, and that's really what counts for us when we actually test things. So <laughs> it, we last, I guess it was uh, not that long ago, March or April, uh, EVGA came out with the GTX mm -hmm. 460 two-win, and what... It's very simple. You take two of those particular GPUs, you put them on a single PCB, right. and you make a new graphics card out of it that basically runs SLI and a stick. And that is what the GTX 560 Ti 2Win does. You have two GTX 560 Ti GPUs on a single graphics card running an SLI, um, and you get the capability then to run those at, at, at much higher performance levels than, than you would in a single one. Um, you know, it's it's it's... It's a good two GPUs. Card. Yeah, it is. It is. It's it's long. It's it's as long <laughs> or a little. It's actually a little bit. It's like a half inch longer than the Radeon mm -hmm. HD sixty nine ninety. I think it's like right. a twelve and a half inch card. So you know, this one. If you have a small case, that might be a concern. Um, you know, the, the benefits of this type of card are well. First of all, it's unique to EVGA. They created it. Nobody else has this card. Usually, you know, something comes out from Nvidia. You know, right. MSI, ASUS, EVGA. All those guys have, you know, the same kind of reference design, and they and they move on from there, and they package it however they can. This, just like mm -hmm. the 460 version, is kind of a custom, unique product to them. 
And, you know, we don't need to get into a whole bunch of details of what the shader counts and all that kind of stuff are. People who listen right. to this are probably familiar with the 560 Ti. But what's interesting is the performance levels in most of our tests were put the 560 Ti to win mm -hmm. at about 25 to 30% faster than the GTX 580, which is <laughs> the fastest single GPU card uh, from NVIDIA. And... You know, noticeably faster than AMD's fastest single GPU right. card, um, and and <clears throat> excuse me, the, the the benefit is the price isn't that much different, right? So the 580 right. will run you about 480 bucks. This card will run you about 520 dollars. So they're still really expensive cards, right? But for 40 bucks more, you're getting a noticeable performance increase in a lot of cases. And and the only way you're getting a an even larger performance increase is if you put two GTX 580s uh, or a pair of 6970s in your system. Um, yeah, yeah. I <laughs> which mean, will, uh, at that point you're up to 900. You know, at 700, you know, 6970 is like 700 for a pair of those. About you're looking at like 900 plus for a pair of GTX 580s. Um, what, you can what get about you a, can get a GTX 590 if you could find mm -hmm. them, but they're like 700 right. to 750 bucks. So it's it's actually a, I mean, it's an expensive card, but in right. terms of its relative performance per dollar type of thing, it's actually pretty good compared to like the 570 and the 580. Well, how are you feel about it? How, the, the, how do you feel about the, the 560 Ti2 win versus an actual pair of GTX 560s in SLI mode? They're, they're, they're basically identical. They're going to perform okay. identically. Um, and actually, when you go into the software, it actually shows up as two different cards. You have to enable SLI in the NVIDIA driver. I mean, it's, it is electrically two GPUs smashed onto a PCB plugged into your system. So the benefit <laughs> is if you, only, if you have, maybe have a mini ITX um, uh, motherboard that only has one PCI Express by 16 slot, you can get the advantages of SLI in this, this fashion that you couldn't get otherwise. But there, there are some drawbacks, right? So... Right. There's only one gigabyte per one gigabyte of memory per GPU. So that kind of limits you in a couple of instances. For example, Metro 2033 is one that stands out. Even though it has more computing power than the 580, the 580 blows it away at like 2560 by 1600 resolution because the 580 has 1.5 gigs of memory on its GPU. And at that high resolution, at those particular image quality settings, the mm -hmm. texture memory required was 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 dramatically higher so the one gigabyte frame up really kind of hurt them i mean you can see um, the average frame rates are lower we had stutters minimum frame rates of zero there were some, there were some issues with that and that only shows up in a couple of instances and that's at 2560 by 1600 which is of course the 30 inch display resolution if you're running 1080p right. we didn't run into any instances like that mm -hmm. with with that but you know this this is a card if they had made it with two gigs of memory per GPU, it would have been more expensive, but it would have been a better <laughs> all card in terms of uh, of performance. Because, you know, with SLI, even though you have two gigs of memory on there, you only can access one gig at a time per GPU. So you're a little bit, little bit uh, limited there. Mm -hmm. We should probably... You know, it's interesting. It's kind of funny. I was, I was flicking forward to the, the Puget system. This is Serenity yeah. Core i5... Uh, uh, the home theater PC review, and it's it's an interesting because a lot of people are like eighteen hundred dollars for a Core i five system. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you guys point out in the review is that first of all, it's it's fourteen hundred dollars for the parts. I think without the acoustic pack, the extra uh, acoustic uh, insulation they put inside the machine to help quiet it down. Uh, two, now along with the Core i five, you're you're looking at an Intel uh, SSD inside of that, and it, it's been interesting to look at at. You know, as you start looking at sort of serious home theater PCs, I got to say, I'm not a huge fan. This is a pretty good home theater PC case if you're looking to stack a home theater PC into a rack of components somewhere near your screen. I say that because it does not have a, a, a VFD or any other kind of or an LCD display on the front because the worst case scenario right. for me is a lot of the home theater, PK, home theater PC cases that were coming out for a while, um, even from Antec, had these displays on the front that were so bright they would actually distract your eyes away from your HDTV or in my case, yep. the, uh, uh, the projector, the, the front screen we're using. Um, and it's interesting. I got to say it's a really nice. Core i5 is really my favorite for a home theater PC. Um, this was using the 
the uh, graphics on the motherboard and not discrete GPU, right? Right. Yeah, it was using it was using okay. the integrated Sandy Bridge graphics, um, and it, it doesn't it has it has space for discrete GPU. What's interesting mm -hmm. is if you go to the the Puget Systems build configuration, it'll let you add in a discrete graphics right. card, but it doesn't keep you in the same build system. Like it, it, you go from the Serenity line of products to the mm -hmm. custom build line of products. So it seems to me that the company is very touchy about uh, introducing any components they did, they don't feel meet the noise requirements, the sound level mm -hmm. requirements of that Serenity line. I mean, you, right. you look at, we, we use a sound level meter and it was like 31 decibels ambient room level and 32.1 decibels right. with the system running full load. I mean, it was very, very impressive. And, and yeah. I think they're very protective of that, of that result. It's enormous. I, I got to say, having having done testing with with systems like this, it is enormously difficult to test audio levels that low without an incredibly expensive. Uh, you know, you're not going to go. You're not going to buy a, a, a Radio Shack SPL meter and measure much of any, or get useful, reasonable measurements much under 40 or 50 dB. 32 dB is extremely quiet. Um, our, our meter dB, goes down low. Our issue is yeah. we don't have a sound room. Like we don't. That's that. No, we're that's, just we're that's, in an office with AC running and yeah. stuff. It's just, yeah. No, that's that's what I was trying to say. Like a typical office is 40 dB. It's enormously difficult to get a room that's much quieter than that because just like you just said, uh, HVAC systems, noises in the yep. wall, traffic outside, people breathing. Um, yeah. <laughs> we would actually um, leave the room and come back yeah. and watch I the mean, recorded video. <laughs> we actually built a uh, basically an isolation box at one point where we had – we could put – it was basically a foam-lined crate with anoechoic material inside of it and a deadening layer behind that. And it was large enough so that we could put a meter between, uh, a physical meter between the meter, the, the SPL meter, and the device we were trying to measure. Because you get to a certain point and it becomes almost impossible without an anoechoic chamber, a very difficult word to say, yep. braces, um, to measure really low sound levels. So it's, it's fundamentally indistinguishable uh, from the background noise in a room. Um, and I, I will say... It becomes a lot easier when you're looking at like sub 40 dB levels. You'll notice them a lot more at 4 a.m., like when everybody in the house is asleep, a lot more than you'll notice them in the middle of the day when cars are driving by or planes are in the sky and stuff like that. We're talking about these are really 30 dB is a really small amount of noise. Um, we've did this, we've done uh, a few reviews of their system. Tell when you're when you're working on something that's that low level, like you can't tell if it's on. When you walk in the room type of thing, it's like, uh, is this, did we leave this one on? No, no, okay, right. no, this one's actually off now. Oh, no, this one's actually on, those types of things. It's, that's what you pay for a little bit for, for, that, for those uh, upcharges, mm -hmm. I guess. But yeah, good system overall. Was the most expensive piece in that case the, the SSD that they're using to boot it? Or yes. The, I was going to say, that's probably the biggest chunk of it. Is that, a, is that, I'm gonna say, is that like a $300 part right that's now? That's like a $300 part. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you pull that out, you're looking at, you know, a $1,400 or $1,500 system. Um, and, you know, people's a, a initial reaction when they see a, a pre-built system is, oh, you're, you're paying too much for all this other stuff. And, right. and like you, you mentioned at the beginning of the discussion, we priced out all the parts and it was about $1,400 from Newegg. And that was before some of the things that I couldn't find, like the uh, sound dampening hard drive enclosure, the acoustic pack uh, and, and a couple of other, uh, like the upgraded fans and that type of stuff as well. So, you know, it, it, it you know, it depends on what kind of buyer you are. Are you the kind mm -hmm. of person that just, are you willing to spend $300, 300 extra dollars to have somebody else that's spent a lot of time and, and built a really good right. system and have it shipped to you and it just works? Or do you want to do it yourself? And there, you know, there's valid reasons to do both. And we, you know, obviously, we're we're mostly a DIY type show and podcast, so sure. there's always that option. Yeah, but sometimes it's nice to not have to figure out like how to cut the foam to fit the inside of the panels, or <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, I, I've, I've been thinking about a lot about like the sort of, so it was like, oh, you should be doing the drywall yourself. And I'm like, I'm watching Alejandro's crew come through and blow through three ceilings in two and a half hours. And when I say blow through, I mean, the work is fantastic, but these guys are machines. And I'm like, yeah, that's four days for me. Mm -hmm. I'll pay the money and have them do it in like a half day. <laughs> it's, you know, this, uh, I was going to say this next product we we're going to talk about, I thought was like right up your alley. Um, it's, we don't have a review of it or anything like that. I just wanted to show you about it because we posted some pictures on PC Perspective. Main Gear. Water the cooling's built, back, baby. <laughs> it's back in a big way. So this, literally, uh, this Main Gear makes systems 
But right. they also are now selling this product called the Main Gear Epic series of kind of self-contained water coolers. So now it's official. Everybody sells a self-contained water cooler. What's different about this one is that it's a 180 millimeter design as opposed to 120. I'm good so with that. So if you look at it, I mean, look at those, those, that picture right there is, two, is, the, is a Corsair H50 on the right. The right. fan represents the radiator size. And on the left is the new Main Gear Epic 180. And it's enormous. We had some comments, but that's, you know, if you drive a Metro, that's like the size of the radiator in your car. A little bit of an exaggeration. But it's, well, having, having put a car radiator on the side of a PC, I can tell you this. The bigger the radiator, the bigger the fan, the less noise you're going to have out of it. And yep. the more surface area you have for cooling, which is a very, very good thing. But so yeah. we're, they're claiming 20%, uh, I think 20% better performance than other similar coolers with the same fan speeds at around 1,000 RPM. So we're going to, hopefully we'll get some time to play with it uh, with Sandy Bridge E in the coming days and see what kind of uh, benefits it gives us for overclocking in terms of temperatures. But uh, they, def they sent that to us with the sole purpose of, here, <laughs> people can buy this. The issue is, there's, I don't know how many cases have room for a 180 millimeter fan well, it's interesting. Click in the, if 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 is Chad, are you on the booth? Can you click on the link at the top that says Epic 180 CPU cooler on the PC per page? Because if you right, click on that, main.com. Yep. Yeah, um, because it's it starts getting really interesting because it's like, oh my goodness, you've got the giant fan, you've got CPU coolers on there, and I, that starts to look. <laughs> You know, that starts to get really interesting when you talk about affordable, simple, I want to see affordable, simple water cooling for fans. That would be really cool. I also want to know where the heck they are mounting um, <laughs> these So if fans. you look at the bottom of that page, that oh, show you their it. designs where they're mounted, which is because uh, they've got those cases that are uh, rotated 20 or 90 degrees. So you can see where they're mounting it, and that's kind of like a, the Silverstone Raven-style chassis design, and they have dual CPU versions and dual right. GPU versions of the same thing. And it's, <laughs> there's, just, there's just not a lot of cases. Like in our office, we have a lot of cases, and I think maybe we could fit in on one of these Corsair uh, cases that we have here, but not many cases have space for 180-millimeter. I don't think so they're, we'll, they're not we'll selling curious. it separately. Are they selling it separately from the cases? Because yes. I can't find it. Yep. Okay. I think so. I think they will. It says, well, maybe not. Buy yours now. Maybe <laughs> they only offer it in their, in their systems. Yeah, maybe that's the case. Guess I'll just have to stick to using my car radiator. <laughs> Still, we'll test it and see how much, uh, how much value they, we get out of it if you decided to build a system. That would be interesting. Should, so, uh, uh, good news here about Steam being hacked, huh? Uh, no, there's no good news there. <laughs> awesome. I thought, it, you know, given, given it, it's kind of crazy. It's, it's, there's been so many amazing games coming out in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I, I've had friends who haven't built a gaming PC in forever. Or suddenly like, oh my God, I got to build a new gaming PC. Look at all these games. They're amazing. And, and there's a lot of amazing console, uh, packages coming right now, uh, coming out right now. But I, I, I like that, uh, Kyle over at Hard OCP posted up, uh, uh it, it would seem that last week's attack on Valve's forums was not, well, excuse me, was a lot more serious than the company originally let on. It just got this email from Valve. Dear Steam users and Steam forum users, uh, forums were defaced in the evening of Sunday, November 6th. We began investigating and found that the intrusion goes beyond the Steam forums. Intruders obtained access to a Steam database in addition to the forums. Contained information including usernames, hashed and salted passwords, game purchases, email addresses, billing addresses, and encrypted credit card information. We do not have evidence that encrypted credit card numbers or personally identifying information were taken by the intruders or that the projection of credit card numbers or passwords was cracked. We are still investigating. I will say, though, you know, if you have, if you are a silly, silly Internet user and you use the same uh, login name and password on Steam as you do on other accounts, it is time to change your password. It is time to get a password manager and start taking security a little more seriously. That, yeah, I'm probably guilty of that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I have that password and use it for the one location. <laughs> um, so yeah, key pass. There's lots of other good ones. It's time. It is unfortunate. It is unfortunate <laughs> timing with all of the PC games out. Like Skyrim launches tonight at midnight oh. as we record this, less than three hours from now. And uh, you're not going. I hope to they sleep don't tonight. use that as an excuse to delay the launch. 
of Skyrim. I I've been laughing. Some friends of mine have been obsessed with. It, yeah, it's. I've got friends who who've barely slept in the last week because of all the games coming out. <laughs> and it only gets worse as we go through November. Uh, yes. Let's does. take a quick break here and uh, thank the first of today's podcast sponsors, perhaps Netflix. Uh, Netflix, a longtime sponsor of the show, and uh, we really appreciate that. Netflix is is a is a lifesaver for those of us who are busy, but yet need a couple of hours of downtime in the day. How can they help you with that? They will stream thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, saving you time, money, and hassle. You don't have to worry about going to a grocery store or a big box retailer uh, and, and trying to swap out discs or doing any of that kind of stuff. You pay your monthly fee. You get Netflix streaming. You can watch whatever you want, whenever you want, and uh, you don't have to worry about returning the movies when you're done, which to me is the best thing. We used to do, my wife and I used to do the, the, the go pick up a movie, and, you know, it's, it's so simple. Just drop it off on your way into the office. It's just, you know, you get stuck in some traffic, and all of a sudden you're adding 15, 20 minutes to your, to your, to your travel time. It's, it's no fun. Um, so Netflix streaming gets past all of that. You can watch Netflix streaming uh, on your Mac, on your PC, of course, uh, iPad, iPhone. There are Android apps. You can watch it on your Xbox 360, your PlayStation 3, your Nintendo Wii, uh, Roku Box, Apple TV. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to access it. And one of the cool features about it is even if you're watching a two-hour movie and you, you, you can't finish it all, if you start watching a, a TV show or anything, basically, in one location, you can resume playing it from that exact spot in any other device or location. So you, I'm, I'm watching a latest episode of a TV show uh, or a whole bunch of series of shows at home. I go out of town. I've got a couple of hours. I'm sitting in the hotel at night by myself. I'll go ahead and resume that movie right where I left off. Uh, you can do that any number of times. You can watch any movie show, movies or TV shows as often as you want. Big benefits there if you have kids that like to watch the uh, same episodes of TV shows over and over. Um, <laughs> Which is, which is really nice. So uh, you don't even have to start paying it. This is the best part. So if you go to netflix.com slash twit, you get 30 days completely free. All you have to do is go to that URL, netflix.com slash twit, try out the service. You can cancel it at any time. There's no long-term subscriptions you have to sign up or anything like that, which is, which is nice. I appreciate that as a consumer that you don't have to be locked into anything. But I think you're really going to like the service. You're really going to like what Netflix does with their streaming video. And uh, again, that URL is netflix.com slash twit. And we thank Netflix for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. I'd like to thank Netflix for their support of my family and keeping entertainment affordable. <laughs> Especially <laughs> when my wife goes on her marathon viewing sessions nice. uh, of Bones. That would have been expensive on other platforms. Oh, you I, get uh, I want to show something off before uh, bef before the man, the myth, the legend pops through the door. Um, not Ryan, another person. This. I was gonna say, wow! I'm gonna just suddenly teleport over there. <laughs> How cool would that be? This is the legendary. Uh, this is an Ultra Book. It is not called the Ultra Book. It is the Asus UX 21E, aka the Zen Book. Sells for a thousand, eleven hundred, depending on the configuration. Um, yes, it is obviously designed to compete with. The MacBook Air. Notice the brushed stainless steel-ish surface. Um, I kind of like that. What do you? I mean, what do you think about that in person? Uh, I like the way it feels. Uh, there is texture to it. Anytime you're, there is texture, and I can hold on to something without dropping it, makes me happy. Um, mm -hmm. Also, it is a little more forgiving of fingerprints, as in, you know, <laughs> Rob's gonna love that. Now he's really uh, gonna be mad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why is my notebook greasy? Um, <laughs> But uh, this particular version, uh, I do not have the password to log in. Um, Core i7, really nice. Actually, a surprisingly good keyboard feel. Um, I was laughing at the UX21 Series Ultra Slim. I don't know if I can get a shot of that up close. Um, but there's like this indecipherable cursive, cursive writing yeah, they tend underneath to do that. the logo. Um, yeah, well, you know, it's Asus, so it's heart touching. <laughs> it was Rock one of my favorite lines of all time. Like that. Um, monitor looks good, uh, you know, like with every computer out there, these, every notebook out there these days, I would like a matte finish on the monitor. Um, but I actually do like the brushed aluminum finish, and I thought it was interesting that the audio by Bang & Olufsen Ice Power was in there. But, you know, this is a pretty nice, this is a pretty nice platform for a Core i7 on the PC. Super light, super, super, super nice. And so that's, apparently, that's the UX21, right, which is yes. uh, an 11-inch screen, right? 
11.6 inch screen in the silver aluminum. And then they've also got the uh, UX 31E, which is a 13.3 inch screen. This would be super portable. I would probably, if it was going to be my everyday computer, go with a 13 inch screen. I find the 11 yeah. inch screens a little frustrating uh, if I'm going into spreadsheets and stuff. Um, yep. But I want to say, I'm trying to remember the exact weight of this, and I'm looking it up. Four gigabytes, do, 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 do. Uh, SO DIM, 128 gigabyte hard drive. <laughs> Why do they always hide the weight? The UX yeah, 2. 2.24 pounds. Okay. The, the, the 13 inch version is 2.86 pounds, according yeah. to Amazon. So that's, I, I would, I would, it's a thousand, the, the, the UX 31 and the 21 are about the same price because you're paying a right. little bit more for the extra portability of the UX 21, basically. Mm -hmm even though it's a smaller screen and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but the, the, the UX31E is $10.99. Uh, if you better hurry, because Amazon only has 20 left, according to them, that it order only soon. Only 20 sense. left. I, I would since. love to get my hands on one of these and see if I could make it my everyday system. My, not my everyday PC, but my everyday laptop. I use my laptop a lot these days. Yeah. I use my MacBook Air pretty much exclusively there it is yeah it's very yeah two point through so for the 13.3 inch macbook air it's 2.96 pounds for the 11.8 inch macbook air it is uh 2.38 pounds excuse me 11, basically it's it's very comparable very comparable in weight and size to the macbook air so, which is probably what they were going for <laughs> That seemed to be the whole point of the Ultrabook campaign. Uh, it feels nice, though. I am, I am impressed. The, uh, it doesn't feel cheap because that was everybody's worry, right, is that because all of these vendors complained about um, having to lower their costs, right? Intel said, you've got to sell it for this price segment. And Asus and all those guys said, no, we can't do it. We can't physically make it. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and Intel said, no, no, you have to do it. So we were all afraid they were going to make some concessions in hardware that – we're going to make it less than ideal. But you haven't seen any of that or nobody has reported any of that to you. So that's good news. No. And uh, yeah, the, the one thing that actually uh, frustrated Rob is there's no 5 gigahertz radio. So it's uh, 811, 802.11 B, G, N on 2.4 gigahertz. There's no uh, 5 gigahertz support. Um, and he found that kind of irritating because he's like, it's only a $5 difference on the radio. And I'm like, who uses A? He's like, I do. <laughs> who uses 5 gigahertz? I do. So um, above and beyond that, though, um, you know, it actually feels it feels pretty nice. You know, it is as, it's not quite as aesthetically sophisticated as MacBook Air, but it doesn't have a giant glowing apple in the middle of the back. So I'm kind of okay with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, call me crazy, but the one thing I couldn't remember is the hard drive specs. Yeah, it's all SSD, 64, 128, or 256 gigabyte SSD. It is pretty much built-in Bluetooth, uh, headphone out, 3.0, USB 3.0. How's the trackpad? Do you like, does a trackpad feel like that MacBook trackpad that I love so much? Yeah, it, it, I have, I've had all of about two and a half minutes with the trackpad. Okay. Because right. unfortunately, I, I, I was not clever enough to keep, you know, the computer open and tapping on it. But yeah, right. it's, it's... Here, let me... Because I was Can under the impression it? that they that they kind of used uh, a, a, the same kind of glass structure that Apple used. Um, I don't know about that, but it feels pretty good. I You know, okay. it, it, it feels better than the, the last two... Uh, uh, the last two Windows trackpads I had, I had an unfortunate experience with a uh, idea pad <laughs> not too long ago. I, I've got the um, X two hundred one, and it's it's like the touch pad is 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 like super tiny, and it's mm -hmm. it, super it's sensitive one of those too. kind of annoyances to everything. Is it's like I I've used MacBooks, I love the trackpad, I love the multi touch gestures and all that kind of stuff. I would like to see kind of that. That actually, over I would there. like to hopefully Rob will let me log into it tomorrow and and see how because i gotta say the multi-touch is super useful on the macbook airs yep for everybody who's not interested in thin and light notebooks let's talk about uh alienware lowered price on the gtx 580m which actually got you guys kind of excited at pc per as in almost well basically taking it from sucking to not sucking is that an oversimplification of of, of it's the, a, it's a the little, difference the price made <laughs> yeah it's a, it's a little bit of oversimplification but we talked right. about we talked about the 580m and the 6990 last week these mobility parts um, and the issue was the performance between both parts was pretty similar 
the features on the NVIDIA parts were better. You get better driver right. support. You had uh, uh, S3D support. You had improved like physics and, and, and GPU accelerated application support and all that kind of stuff. The problem was the NVIDIA part was $300 more than the AMD part. Ouch. And literally within like 48 hours of that pub of our publication of this review. I don't claim to, to have pushed around Dell to do this. I'm not saying I did, but I'm not saying we didn't. It's like within 48 hours, they dropped the price by 225 bucks. So now the NVIDIA part is $75 more than the AMD part. Still not even, but the advantages of driver support uh, that you get, if you're buying a, a, a gaming notebook, like a notebook with the intent of gaming on it, the right. day of driver releases, I, I really think are worth that kind of $75 long-term investment. And it, what it forced us to do was, you know, before we had the AMD part as the editor's choice and the NVIDIA part as a gold award. So basically we had it, we would recommend the AMD part. And then, you know, if you want to go to NVIDIA, go that way. And we kind of flipped it now because now that that's a really dramatic price difference. So we wanted to go back and kind of adjust our article to, to, to show that, that $75 difference for uh, on an $1,800 to $2,000 machine is is what we th we think is a very worthwhile investment for for the differences you get there, all else being equal. So that's all I wanted to do is kind of give uh, give everybody a little update on that because you know it was such a dramatic change in price. We're talking about $300 to $75. So that's a big change. <laughs> yeah. Something else is coming up. It looks like both you and I will be talking about next week very soon. Yes. <laughs> uh, some some special new hardware. I don't think it it's it's a big stretch to tell everybody that it probably involves Intel. It probably involves Sandy Bridges, and it probably involves a letter E. I yeah, that's more than I'm willing to say. So Sandy Bridges is talked about for a long time. <laughs> it's been out at right. IDF. They they've demoed it and they've showed it. We're getting very close to actually releases on that. It'll be out and available before the holidays. Uh, you don't have to wait for CES to get that stuff, which is good news. And I, is, for one, will be glad to see new, I would be glad to see, not glad to see, X58 out of the way, kind of moved on, progressed past. <laughs> Been around for a is, long time, more than three years now. Is, is your review going up on Monday or Tuesday? Uh, Monday, Monday, Monday. So the, the, yeah, Monday at some point in the middle of my night, which is whatever they decided to <laughs> Which is unfortunate. At 4 a.m. on Monday, unless we decide, or unless somebody breaks it at like 2 a.m. on Monday, in which case you'll get a phone call. <laughs> yeah. Nice. We've got a uh, dog pile of viewer questions for you today, but we should take a moment to thank our friends at Ford, another sponsor of the podcast. Absolutely. Absolutely. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Ford, featuring Sync AppLink. Sync AppLink, which is a little bit harder to say. Um, when <laughs> you say it many times over row, Sync AppLink enables you to control selected applications from your smartphone with uh, pretty simple voice commands while you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Obviously, Ford is looking out for safety of uh, you and me because even if I don't have that car, I don't want you reaching down for your cell phone all of the time. So with Sync AppLink, you can do things like uh, voice control Pandora in your car. You can listen to your tweets with an application called OpenBeak just by asking with a simple voice command. Uh, so once your smartphone is linked to Pandora, for example, you can use voice commands to uh, select your favorite station or make a new one. You can bookmark songs to purchase. You can give songs thumbs up, thumbs down. Anything that you could basically do with Pandora before, you can do with this application uh, integration there. So uh, you could say PlayStation Classic Rock, bookmark song, thumbs up. Yeah, with OpenBeak, you can say read my timelines, read replies, and it will... Read those, read that information to you, as you know, out loud, voice to, or text to speech, basically, and you get to get all that information while you're on the go, while still remaining uh, a safe driver, which is important to all of us. Uh, Sync AppLink is built on an API platform as well that allows Ford to continue to work with developers in the app community to bring more apps to life with voice in their vehicles, and that's pretty cool. Is that this is going to be something that will be built upon? It will grow. Uh, and it won't just be limited to Pandora and OpenBeak. Voice activated Sync AppLink is available on the 2012 Ford Fiesta. You can learn more about this and other technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford 
dot com slash technology ford dot com slash technology and we greatly appreciate ford's support of uh this week in computer hardware and the entire twit network and uh yeah check it out it's pretty cool stuff uh i'm greatly looking forward to the day when cars will the ford uh fiesta <laughs> 2019 will drive me where i need to go all I have to say is drive me to Rupper Arena in Lexington, and it will do it. Voice activated, of course. Hands right. off, and then I can get some work done on the drive down. You can sleep nice. on your way to the. Uh, oh wait, on your <laughs> way to the event. We've actually, I was actually driving in a 2012 Ford Mustang this afternoon and getting my sync on, and uh, it's kind of trippy when you actually send yourself directions, um, basically email directions, and they show up in the dashboard of your car and your sync system, and then it tells wow. you how to get from point A to point B. That was actually really fun for me. I was like, cool. oh, I can plan a trip and send it to my car, and my car will tell me where to go. <laughs> Which is actually not quite where you're going in terms of having the car drive you, but it's a step. It's close. It's step. As long as we get there. <laughs> we got an email from Yan who says, I'm the IT manager for a small printing company, 42 employees, and buy all my PCs from Dell, Optiplex. That's their, if you're not familiar with Dell, Optiplex is there. Or I should say, if you're not familiar with Dell's corporate options or enterprise options, Optiplex uh, is the brand of PCs. And pretty much every major PC manufacturer has it where they change the stuff as slowly as possible with the idea that once a large corporation uh, vets a machine and accepts it, they don't have to retest their machine in six months because you threw it new you know chipset or motherboard or, or gpu on there the idea is that these things remain relatively stable for two or three years at a time yan says we are setting up more and more of our office employees with dual 24 inch monitors and every time i need to set up an older pc with two screens i need to acquire a new dual head card what i tend to do is buy a 125 five dollar card like a gts 450 but I feel like I'm wasting my money as there are $35 cards with dual display capabilities. The other thing I ran into recently is the nicer cards will not fit into an Optiplex as they need two slots, one for the connector and the other for the cooling, I guess. I ended up installing the GGS 450i had purchased from Newegg into a Dell Precision that is used for graphics. What would you recommend as a good option for driving two 24-inch monitors? It does not need to be cheap, but I don't want overkill. So, and I see a couple of items from Newegg listed at this. Yeah, it's, you know. How low can you go? <laughs> you're, I mean, seeing... so he's not doing 3D stuff, right? right. Um, and 24-inch monitors are going to be 1080p resolution or below. And any, basically any modern GPU will be able to do this that, he, that he's wanting to do. And actually, I think this exact same problem existed at the, uh, the new Twit Studios when I was in town. And um, we had an issue where there was a particular card that was in use. That was, they'd pulled out of one kind of workstation to another, and it was actually a, a weird connector that split into two DVI connections. Right. But they were single link, and they were all kind of weird things like that, where, you know, you can get a Galaxy GeForce GT520 for 55 bucks that is single slot. Or you can go the ASUS route, and that's like $44, and that's a Radeon 5450. And, you know, they have uh, a VGA, an HDMI, and an, a uh, DVI output. And my guess is that those monitors have DV they at least have DVI and VGA inputs. If they don't have HDMI, you know, this card will run two, uh, two monitors off of it with a, a DVI cable and then a VGA to DVI adapter or a VGA cable. So, uh, you know, right. and you, I think you can even go lower price than this, but I was just trying to keep it in kind of a, a modern GPU family. You want to do like GPI or the PCI Express adapter? That's a joke, by the way. I meant yeah, AGP no, 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 no. with the PCI Express adapter, which does not exist. So please don't ask me where you can get your PCI Express to AGP <laughs> adapter. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, you know what, 55 bucks, if you're talking about like, you know, 20, 30 systems, 55 bucks is a big savings over 125 bucks. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But we like to an email money. from. Charlie he was asking about the new GTX 570 with two and a half gigs of memory. It says, last year I built myself a Core i7 930 system with all the bells and whistles, the crown jewel of the system, and the reason my family and friends think I'm crazy is fully invested in NVIDIA's surround technology. He has three <laughs> Acer 1080p monitors driven by a pair of GTX 470s and SLI. And yes, monitors and video cards were half the cost of the computer. I'm actually surprised that's all it was. Uh, it was just half when you get the monitors in there. Says he's been happy with the system. It runs most games on high detail. Though some super high-end games like Metro 2033, I have to crank the detail down as the video cards can't keep up on those games. 
I know the GTX 500 series are just an incremental upgrade, so it's not really worth it. However, this week I came across something interesting on Newegg, a G EVGA GTX 570 with two and a half gigs of video memory. I know that when dealing with high resolutions, performance improves with more video RAM in that 1.2 gigs isn't really enough for the, five, uh, the 5760 by 1080 resolution uh, that he's using on that NVIDIA surround setup. But how big improvement do you guys think I could get? Also, would it be <laughs> possible for PC Pro to do a review on this card, especially with multi-monitor setups in mind? Um, interesting, and we did just kind of discuss this when we were talking about uh, the 560 Ti to win from EGA, talking about the one gigabyte frame buffer not being enough for the 2560 by 1600 resolution in Metro 2033. Kind of ironic, everything comes <laughs> around. So yeah, yeah, but up here, you know, the 470 has 1.2 gigs of memory. Mm -hmm. And even though you're running an SLI, the system only gets to access one of them. So this five, the GTX 570 with two and a half gigs of memory, I, I haven't, I hadn't seen that or heard of right. that card actually until I got it. So specifically in Metro 2033, I think, yes, you will see a, an advantage in that particular instance. My issue is these 570s, I'm going to kind of look up their price here because that's what kind of bothers me, is um, so they're $394 on Newegg. They're out of stock right now, which um, is about, that's not too bad. It's actually a $50 or $60 increase over the standard 570 price. My issue is he has to buy, he has to buy two of these. So he's talking about almost $800 worth of graphics cards. And I, not enough games are going to require that type of resolution, or I'm sorry, right. that type of frame buffer that I think it's worth spending $800 on. I mean, unless he's not worried about 800 bucks. If you're not worried about 800 bucks, then what you should actually buy is probably like a GTX 590 or, you know, two 580s or something like that. That's, you know, I would get, I would probably go the route of going two 580s for a little bit more money rather than two of these 570s with uh, more memory on it. But it's, it's, it's hard, it's hard to, to say that how much performance you get out of it because it's like Metro 2033, you're probably going to go from not playable the, all, the highest settings to playable at the highest settings. That's a big plus. But right. even games like Battlefield 3, I don't think you're going to see a huge increase because one point. 2.5 or 1.28 or 1.25 gigabytes of memory is still a lot for a graphics card. Not there's aren't there aren't many cards that have much more than that. Most games are built kind of targeted that one gigabyte uh, level. So I I would personally I think that's a you know if you're building a new system and, and it's only 50 bucks more for the two and a half gigs versus the 1.25 gigs. Sure, right. I, I could see using that uh, that money wisely for that way, but not I don't think to upgrade from a system that I don't think he's going from 470s, 570s, some performance benefit in terms of compute power, but not a whole lot to pay $800 just for more frame buffer seems like a bad decision to me. <laughs> I think that's probably a pretty accurate summary. Simon's got a question about X-Plane upgrades. Um, he says, I've been pondering a GPU upgrade for a while. I play X-Plane casually, and I'm not happy with how my current and very outdated ATI Radeon HD 2600 Pro is performing. I'm not wanting to spend a lot of money. I was wondering if a Radeon HD 5450 would be a significant jump in performance for casual X plane gaming, or do I need to spend more to get any significant in-game performance? So if you are not familiar with X plane, it is, uh, uh, they call it the world's most powerful flight simulators by a company called uh, Laminar Research. And it's pretty slick. They basically came up, I'm trying to find, there's a where did it go? Where did it go? Um, basically, they do a professional version that's FAA certified, um, and they do some pretty wild simulations, some pretty sophisticated simulation of aerodynamics. Um, there it is. The uh, Yeah, there's basically an FAA simulator, and it's, uh, where did it go? Where did it go? The most realistic flight model available for home users, not just a game, an engineering tool that can be and is used to predict the flight characteristics of nearly any aircraft with incredible accuracy. Um, and what's pretty slick about it is they basically read in the geometric shape of the aircraft and then figure out how the aircraft will fly, um, which is, I don't know, it's, it's slick. It's a pretty serious piece of engineering, and you can get it for 30 bucks. There's a free demo. Um, if you take a look at the X-Plane developer blog, uh, X-Plane 10 is not out yet, but it is 
about to be released. X-Plane 9 is the current version. And I would kind of hesitate to do any hardware upgrades for X-Plane until I knew what was going on with X-Plane 10 um, since it's coming out. But if you look at, uh, uh, if you take a look at uh, X-Plane 10 and GPU power, which is up on the, uh, uh, the developer's blog up at the X-Plane website, um, as X-Plane 10 gets closer to shipping, we're getting a better idea of what its performance characteristics are going to be. Uh, this was the, basically, it's like the first of several posts on the hardware in X-Plane 10. Spoiler alert, the buying advice I can give is at best fairly vague and obvious. Don't buy an old piece of junk direct X 7.1 graphics card for $29. <laughs> uh, and, 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 then, and then, the you know, basically Ben says, once the SIM ships and people start posting real performance, performance comparisons, I suspect community data will be a much richer source of information on planning a new system. Um, but basically, he was running it on a bunch of uh, uh, Mac GPUs, uh, Mac Pro with a single Radeon AC 5870, which is a huge step beyond uh, what you're running with the 2600 Pro. Um, yes. You know, and it's basically, uh, you know, with that level card, you're going to have pretty much everything you can. But the thing is, in terms of like almost all the, the performance you can get out of the application, the thing is, though, is, is one of the things they explained that they're changing the geometry um, in X-Plane 10. Quote, it can be bottlenecked not only by your CPU, but also by PC Express bus bandwidth because CPU, is, CPU use is more efficient in version 10. We sometimes get stuck where there isn't enough bandwidth to transfer geometry from the CPU to the GPU. Um, so basically, make sure you have a PCI Express X16 slot um, <laughs> and watch right. out for the shader effects like atmospheric scattering, uh, lighting, some of the rendering they do. Um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how much of that's actually turned on. Uh, this is pretty different from X-Plane 9. With X-Plane 9, you can turn off all of the GPU effects. There is really only one, quote, per pixel lighting, unquote. Crank 16X FSAA, run at 2560 by 1024 and get 27 frames per second on my older Radeon 4870. In other words, X-Plane can't even keep a previous generation GPU busy at very high settings. Um, right. So my thought is this, um, you know, the, the other issue I have is, Simon, you didn't tell us what your CPU is, um, so I don't know how that's going to fare against the new GPU. I would say wait for X-Plane 10, because most flight sim enthusiasts I know are super dedicated. They, they use the applications forever. It's not like you're going to be playing this, you know, it's not like a game you bought. You're going to play it for three weeks, get burned out on it, not touch it for six months. I would probably wait until version 10 is out and then take a look at what the, the hardware you need to satisfy version 10. <laughs> um, you know, that said, uh, a 5450 would probably be a good start for version 9. Um, and it's interesting because it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting application because they're basically like, yeah, you're not going to take advantage. They, they don't take advantage of Crossfire or SLI. Um, they keep it pretty simple in terms of uh, the actual physical support. But, yeah, um, where did it go? Where did it go? I lost one of the links I wanted to bring up there. Um, <laughs> You know, in the, the other thing is like they love the they want you to update your graphics drivers constantly in Windows. Um, where did it go? All right, I lost the page with the hardware spec recommendations because I suck. Um, question there. There's questions about hardware. Uh, so basically, like yeah, SLI and Crossfire is not supported. What other hardware should I buy? Yeah. X-Plane 9 requires a computer with at least a 2 gigahertz processor, a gigabyte of RAM, 32 megabytes of video RAM, 10 gigabytes of hard space, um, you know, a quad-core processor, 4 gigs of RAM, and a 2 gigabyte card can be used, and X-Plane will take full advantage of it. Uh, multiple cores are useful. Uh, so if you don't have a multiple core CPU, definitely get one, a two or four core. Uh, CPUs with multiple cores are useful because the X-Plane will use that second core to load scenery while flying. This eliminates the tenth of a second stutter usually associated with transfer transitioning from one scenery file to another, which is still experienced when using a single core processor. Uh, Hyper-threaded CPUs are a little more than marketing hype. Um, video RAM is a big plus. And quote, while Intel makes a fine CPU, their integrated video cards are, at the moment, awful for X-Plane. So that's, uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I think X-Plane is like one of the coolest applications on the planet, so I get kind of excited when I see anything on it. Um, no, that's good. But uh, I would, I would, you know, 
I don't think the Radeon HD 5450 uh, is a bad idea, but I would definitely make sure you had at least a dual core and preferably a quad core CPU. Um, you know, and I also, it's, it's just, it's, it's an older GPU. It's pretty slow. You might want to wait and see what the specs are looking at for version 10 R uh, just to see whether or not you want to start saving up money for an entirely new system. Um, I'm trying to think what else is kind of in that range, the, the Radeon 5450. I mean, um, you've got like the uh, the GeForce GT 540 is kind of being in that same range too. I right. mean, I I, I think it's you're right. You really kind of need to wait to 10, see if you need to if you can if you if your CPU is going to be enough and you just want to go to a higher GPU. I know X Plane tends to be very CPU heavy as well. Right. Uh, so. You know, maybe a 5570. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you can get up to like the 5770 and you're getting to a lot more horsepower for right. not a whole lot of, uh, of additional cash, in my opinion. You don't have to yeah. get into the 58 series or the 68 series or anything like that. But, uh, you know, the more you can get, the better. It, you know, maybe one day he's going to go down in the, get a Radeon card and do multi, uh, multi-display <laughs> as well, like our previous yeah. emailer. So. It's, yeah, it's been interesting to see how fast, I don't know. I, 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 I can't wait to see X-Plane 10. So I'm going to stop talking about X-Plane. You're going to talk about Bulldozer Mini ITX. <laughs> All right, let's see. We got an email here. Where are we at? Did I miss it? Email from Jared about Bulldozer Mini ITX. Oh, uh, okay, okay. You you had already bolded it. I thought that meant we had gone through the question already. So sorry. that's what it was. He says, I've been a big fan of Patrick's work since he first appeared on the screensavers on ZDTV over 11 years ago. Yeah, I slowed I down. so part. old. <laughs> uh, and, I'm very, and I'm very quickly becoming a huge fan of Ryan's work. Thank you very much, Jarrett. We, we appreciate that. So here's the question. Any idea when we might see some AMD 990FX chipset action in a mini ITX form factor? Or is it possible that it is already exists and my Google Foo is broken? I hear the bulldozer CPUs are practically made for server loads, and I'd love to build a small virtualization box around this chip. Is it hmm. even a good idea? Thanks, and keep up the awesome work. So your Google Foo is not broken, apparently. I also did some searching, or maybe we're both broken, but I do not believe there is a mini ITX bulldozer-ready motherboard. Hmm. Now, there are lots of micro ATX boards that support the AM3 plus processor socket, which is what is required to support the, uh, the bulldozer, the AMD FX series of processors. So you can still build a small system, but you can't get into the mini ITX capability there. Um, I, I would say that uh, it is not, it's, you're right, the, this server, the chip was really built with server applications in mind. Virtualization is in particular one of those things. And they were much like uh, Intel tries to do with some of their products, take that high-end stuff and bring it down to the consumer. It wasn't very successful uh, for AMD with the bulldozer lineup here. But for virtualization, that kind of stuff, it should be pretty good. So I'm kind of look here. There are only apparently seven mini ITX motherboards in existence for uh, AMD platforms currently. I'm looking at Newegg here. And uh, so uh, there, there are lots of micro ATX versions. You can get those for as low as 55 bucks, maybe a little bit cheaper than that if you look for rebates and stuff. Um, and if I, I'm looking at the mini ITX options now. And what's interesting is that there are several, looks like all of these are uh, yeah, AM3, but not AM3 plus, which means it's very close to having support, but they're 800 series chipsets not 900 series chipsets. So you're kind of out of luck there on the mini ITX form factor. What's interesting is all those mini ITX motherboards are more expensive than some of the micro ATX motherboards simply because just like we were talking about with laptops, you pay a little bit more to get that smaller size because if you're getting that really small size, people assume that it's, you're, you're willing to pay more for the compressed nature of, uh, of that form factor. So I, I still think it's a good idea if you're, if you're wanting to build a system specifically for virtualization. Uh, but maybe look uh, the micro ATX route as opposed to, you know, really focusing on the mini ITX specifically. Don't get obsessed with motherboard sizes. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a longtime listener from England here named David. He says, I'm looking to upgrade my aging system. I wondered if you could help me with a question on motherboard choices. I am pretty much set on a Core i5-2500K processor. Love that part. But while looking at motherboards, I have noticed that some now come with PCI 3.0 slots and supposed compatibility with the forthcoming Ivy Bridge CPUs. 
Does having PCI 3.0 slots guarantee compatibility with Ivy Bridge? Does not having PCI 3.0 mean that my potential new board will never support Ivy Bridge? To me, it would make sense to get the newer hardware, but there is an increase in cost. Looking at the Asus Z68 boards, it's around 20 to 30 pounds. It's about uh, 40 to 60 bucks US over here in the UK. Is it worth it? I would hate to purchase a new motherboard CPU combo and find that I could never upgrade the processor down the line should I want to. Keep up the excellent work, guys. Loving the show. It makes my miserable commute so much more bearable. <laughs> David, we are pleased and honored to help with your miserable commute. I would like to say that if you get a Core i5-2500, um, you will not uh, be ruined in terms of upgrades. You, you just, you know, it, it's kind of funny because there's a lot of room between a Core i5-2500 and a Core i7 uh, that will fit in the same slot. I do not know, though, about the Ivy Bridge support in terms of, you know, the, the, I, I want to say Ivy Bridge support does not exactly equal PCI 3.0 slots, and then it gets fuzzy for me. Um, the two, the, 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 those two things, Ivy Bridge support and PCI Express 3.0 support, are actually mutually exclusive. Yeah. Uh, they, they, you don't have to have one to have the other. But I don't know of any that um, don't support it. So here's what's interesting. So Ivy Bridge will have support for PCI Express 3.0. But the benefit of PCI Express 3.0 is it's backwards compatible to 2.0. So um, even if your motherboard doesn't properly implement the necessary hardware to run PCI Express 3.0 correctly, Ivy Bridge will still work on it as long as the BIOS supports Ivy Bridge. In particular, there are some motherboards that are already out, Z68 boards, that claim support for both Ivy Bridge and PCI Express 3, but they only support PCI Express 3 on the primary slot, actually. Um, so, what all that means is uh, you, you know, if you do SLI, you'd get two 2.0 ports instead of a 3.0 and a 2.0 port. So, um, yeah, I, I, you can definitely still do that, and, and I think it's actually smart. You don't have to have PCI 3 to get both necessarily, but uh, as, as long as your board supports Ivy Bridge, that's what you want to look forward to. So. Hmm. We got an email from James who has an upgrade and resolution issue. It says, hi, guys. My roommate's rocked an old P4, 2.6 gigahertz, 3 gigs of RAM, and an HD Radeon 4550 video card. Screen resolution is 1280 by 768 VGA on a, I would assume, uh, traditional... Uh, CRT monitor. Yep. She decides, she decided, the roommate decided she wants a new PC. She's a gamer, plays older games like Hellgate London, Morrowind, Fallout 3, and Oblivion. She would like to play Diablo 3 and Skyrim, uh-oh, without having to drop all the settings to a minimum. Big uh-oh. Here's where I run into problems. Yes, yes, I bet you are. She doesn't want to get a new monitor or spend more than five or $600. What do you suggest? Thanks for your time and effort. So it's essentially a 720p monitor. Um, mm -hmm. which is manageable. The yeah. Pentium 4 running at 2.6 gigahertz drives me a little crazy. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 because, well, you're thinking, like, at this point, it's, it's hot. the Radeon it's 45, hot. yeah, I mean, it's like $500, doesn't want to buy a new monitor, so you're not going to get up to 1080p. Um, and I'm thinking, like, we're looking at maybe a new motherboard, a new CPU, Four gigs of RAM is thirty-five dollars, or you find it lying yep. on a street corner these days. So that's <laughs> that's positive news, and probably one hundred and fifty bucks. Well, actually, you know what? For five hundred bucks, if the power supply can support it, and that's where it gets ugly too. So we're probably looking at a new power supply, new motherboard, more RAM, and a new GPU. Um, the low-end system on the hardware leaderboard at PC Perspective is four hundred ninety-eight bucks. It's Core i three. Uh, with a motherboard, it's a Radeon 6670, mm -hmm. 4 gigs of memory, 500 gig hard drive, and a new power supply to boot. Ooh. Um, so, I mean, with that budget, I think she doesn't have a problem with it. I, right. I, would, I would love to say you could get away with, like, a $200 hardware upgrade or $300 hardware upgrade and then, like, physically force her hand to click the buy button on a new display. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I, I saw that question and I saw... 1280 by 768 monitor. I mean, it's like tablets have high resolutions than that kind of stuff. Some phones are getting there. I was going to say, next generation iPhone will have a higher resolution than yeah, that. Yeah, it's just like that's, I mean, 
you can do it, right? So 720p gaming is not awful, right? I'm not trying to, to make it sound like that, but it's like you want to play Skyrim. You're talking about one of the games that's going to look gorgeous on the right. PC if you have enough hardware to push it. Diablo 3, even one of those. Um, getting a 1080p display, you can get those for like under $200, I think now. You know, not Absolutely. super high-end quality ones, but, but decent 1080p monitors for under 200 bucks. Uh, yeah, I would say, man. I would maybe show her... Like, if you're gaming on a 1080p screen right. with better hardware, kind of show her the difference, right? You know, even if it involves bringing your computer over and setting the monitor next to her monitor. And it, <laughs> it, just, it doesn't say what size it is. It's, is that a 17-inch display or something uh, like that? I would assume. 17-inch uh, well, display or, you know, I, I was going to say, like, 1280 by 7. That's WXGA, so that, that, yeah. that reeks of 17, maybe maybe 19-inch, but I'm thinking probably a 17-inch flat panel or CRT, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I really want I really wanted to have a new monitor. Um, After listening to this part of this podcast, we, <laughs> that the best thing you can do, and with this, we say this a lot, one right. of the best things you can do for your system that you don't really get all the time, you don't necessarily think of, is you upgrade the item that you look at the entire time you use your computer. It's like the same thing when I say buy a good keyboard and mouse because right. you are using those all of the time. Every time you touch your not computer. Using all the time. GP, you're not using all the time. They're important. But it, it's, you know, getting a really, really good engine in your car, but not having a steering wheel or you know, putting the <laughs> worst tire the windshield type of thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at that, man. Core i3, the Biostar motherboard, that's 235. 300 with the memory, 330 with the, uh, with the, uh, yeah, 330 with the memory and the GPU. Uh, use the onboard audio. This, yeah, you know, 40, yeah. Oh, if it's just, it would be tight, but recycle the case, recycle the OS. I, I, I want you, tell your roommate we want her desperately to get a new monitor for 600 bucks. <laughs> you, should, you should just be able to squeak in. You should just be able to squeak in a new monitor on that. Probably not going to be able to recycle the power supply, although maybe. Um, maybe. I'm gonna, maybe. Uh, depends on how late in the Pentium 4 lifespan that thing came up. Anyhow, you've, you've heard what we have to say. I, I'd, I'd say get the 600 buyer a monitor and the rest of the parts and, and, and really piss her off until she starts playing <laughs> Skyrim. And then she'll disappear in a room for like four and a half days like everybody I know has touched Skyrim in the last week. <laughs> an email from Sean about Unraid. He says, I'm looking to create an Unraid server. Can you recommend budget hardware for my server? Below are some, excuse me, some one of the points on this project. Thanks. Keep up the great work on twit.tv. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we are, by the way, Twitch. This Week in Computer Hardware. Not to be confused with Twit, This Week in Technology. He says, I need at least six SATA connectors on the motherboard. That means you're going to be building a relatively recent uh, uh, motherboard system. I believe onboard video will be adequate. Yes. As uh, a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure you can run Unraid headless. Not sure whether to go with AMD or Intel. Um, and it's interesting. So Unraid, if you're not familiar with it, it's like free NAS. Um, it is a self-contained um, Unix E. Uh, uh, it basically, it's a dedicated operating system to run servers. And uh, it's made by a company called Lime Technology. I won't call it open source. Um, but if you take a look at uh, lime-technology.com, um, basically, it's an embedded network attached storage server operating system designed to boot from a USB flash device and specifically designed for digital media storage, digital video, digital music, digital images, and photos. Um, Unraid server employs a, quote, unique RAID technology, which in a lot of ways actually reminds me of uh, the Drobo boxes or uh, sort yeah, of Yeah, that's, that's, that's why I was interested. When I read the description of it, that's what yeah. I thought of. You know, they call it Unraid, uh, quote, it is similar to a RAID 4 in that for every N hard drives, there are N minus 1 data drives and a single fixed parity drive. So basically, they push all the parity data, the restoration data, off to its own, uh, off to its own drive. Tolerates a single failed hard drive, tolerates single drive read errors. Uh, those are corrected on the fly. Uh, unlike other RAID organizations, however, files are not striped across the data drives. Instead, each data drive is formatted normally with its own file system. The Unraid organization offers several key advantages over other RAID systems, increased flexibility, easier expansion. And it's kind of interesting. Basically, you want more storage in an Unraid, you slap in another hard drive. And then you don't have to wait 24 hours while it stripes data across it. Um, 
It'll spin down if, if you have the right hardware. It'll spin down your hardware to conserve uh, power consumption. Uh, quote, potentially better multiple stream read performance if multiple files are read from different disks. And that's the important part. If, you know, if, 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 if you're watching streaming video to a receiver in one room and somebody's streaming video to the Blu-ray player in the other room, you know, doing its, its onboard playback, if those two videos are on separate hard drives, potentially you can get better uh, uh, multi-stream street breed performance there um, they sell hardware um, and it's pretty simple stuff it's basically like uh, where is it where is it where is it um, they're running you know their, their entry-level stuff is a super micro uh, motherboard and an Intel Celeron e1500 processor uh, an optional core 2 duo processor four gigs of RAM um, you know, so their hardware, their hardware is actually more optimized for, um, is more optimized for storing massive amounts of hard drive than it is for needing a particularly large amount of hardware. Um, but where is it? Uh, the primary consideration for motherboard choice is the number of onboard SATA ports. Um, their MD15 uses the Supermicro C2SEE, C2SEA motherboard with six onboard ports. Um, the uh, C2C also includes three, C three PCI Express slots, two of which are capable of PCI Express X4 operation. And then they can use PCI Express disk controllers to operate at X4 or, or 4X speeds and get more uh, hard drives stuffed into the case. They want you to use onboard gigabit, onboard video, uh, and uh, you want to make sure you can boot from USB flash. Everything, all the new motherboards will boot from USB flash. So their recommendation, the ones they build from are the Supermicro motherboards. And I think those are pretty cheap if memory serves. Mm. Um, bink. Do, 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 do. It's a, yeah, it's like a $110, $120 motherboard. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, that's reasonable. Yeah, and uh, what's really cool is like one of the things, one of the reasons they use the, the C2C or the C2SEA uh, is that it has a, quote, female USB port mounted right on the motherboard that lets you easily install your Unraid server flash device internally so it's not hanging out the back of the box where it will be huh. kicked uh, if somebody walks cool. behind it. Yeah. Um, I'm, very, I'm very interested in building one of these systems now after hearing all this stuff. It's pretty slick. It's a pretty cool setup. Um, you know, they've got a pretty good, uh, in, the, in the wiki, they've got a pretty good article on improving Unraid performance. Um, you know, number one is use gigabit networking, <laughs> reduce latency. Um, uh, basically, they talk about jumbo frames. Use a cache drive. You can add a cache drive. Uh, if you basically pay for the Plus or Pro license, there's like a free version. Then there's uh, uh, advanced versions that you pay some money for. And I don't remember it being particularly expensive. The Pro version uh, supports 21 disks, and it's $190, $119, I think. So, yeah, pretty, yeah. pretty reasonable compared to, yeah. you know, buying a NAS. Yeah, basic is like three drives, plus is six drives, pro is 21 drives. You need a plus or a pro to do a cache drive. So if you had a cache drive, um, that actually will help with your write speed because basically uh, you write to the cache drive and then it parses the data off the cache drive at the parity process and get its own time. Um, you can move the parity drive off the PCI bus. Um, you move your largest and fastest drives off the PCI bus. It's There's some really interesting... Uh, it's it's they've spent a lot of time kind of you know optimizing the you know this as a server because they sell it um, <laughs> you know the uh, the pre-configured boxes uh, I actually got to really I got to say it's if uh, you know, let me drop that in so you can actually see it in there in the uh, rundown. Uh, the MD fifteen ten server they do like three versions of it. Uh, my favorite one being the. Uh, the Lian Li uh, PCA17B case, um, which is, has uh, like five, uh, three five-in-one drive cages. Um, and I've never actually seen one of these for sale. I desperately won one. Uh, yeah, I know. Server. Those are awesome looking. <laughs> um, I don't remember them being particularly cheap. Um, oh, it's disappointing. I'm a big fan of cheap as well. Yeah, well, gee, it's, yeah, this is, uh, oh, I can't find one for sale. Oh. All right. In any case, um, 
I'd say, uh, uh, Sean, uh, I'd say uh, probably stick with Intel because uh, we've been doing that a lot lately. Uh, and they develop on Intel. They sell Intel boxes. Um, the Intel Celeron is more than enough power for the basics. So I would, mm -hmm. I would, take a str I would strongly consider mirroring uh, Lime Technologies basic builds. Um, you know, even their more expensive one is pretty... Simple, yeah, it's an E1500. So they're saying an Acceleron has enough performance. Um, there are a lot of articles, um, you know. I mean, basically, as far as they're concerned, it's like gigabit and onboard video and a lot of SATA parts, SATA, bleh, SATA ports um, are, are what they're looking for. You know, quote, just about any CPU is powerful enough to run unraid server and a media server application. The bottleneck lies in the bus speed where PCI Express is far faster than PCI and disk speed. Um, you know, if you'll be running other server applications, then it might be advantageous to use a more powerful processor. But basically, they want you to have a whole lot of bandwidth over PCI Express. Uh, yeah, onboard video, completely adequate. Uh, I would go with Intel, Celeron, Core i3, and uh, yeah, at least six SATA connectors on the motherboard and as many PCI Express slots as you can get on there. Um, yeah, it's fun, actually. Uh, they've got, like, I'm already in the middle of trying to build a couple of free NAS boxes. That's exactly what I don't need to be doing, is trying to build an unrated project. Box. It's the same, yeah. <laughs> what we need here is a third project. Um, I do like the fact that the, the <laughs> C2SC, that Supermicro, has the, uh, the uh, USB header USB on the motherboard. Answer. Man, I'm. Uh, let's do. Let's do. Well, we'll we're. Uh, <laughs> we might do something like that here because we might actually be able to use it internally, as well. So I might download that software and kind of play around with it and see if I like its reliability. My always, my question would always be: uh, motherboard dies. Can I get all that data off the array? How easy is that? That's always my concern with RAID arrays and NAS devices right. and all that type of stuff. So well, you know, a drive dies. I understand how all that works. RAID controller dies, motherboard dies where all those drives are hooked up. Right. Now that's where I get into my question marks. So I think, you know what? Let's talk about that in another episode because I'm okay. about to dig in. Because I know there's a really fast answer to that, um, but I don't want to give the wrong answer because it was the first answer that popped into my head. <laughs> Which is probably a good piece of advice, and we'll end this week in computer hardware on that. <laughs> Think twice. Talk once. Um, <laughs> I'm Patrick Gordon. Words to live. Oh, my goodness. Um, there's so much, yeah, there, I have avoided so much trouble in my life if I'd paid more attention to that concept. Um, that's it for this week in computer hardware. I'm Patrick Norton. Brian Schrout. We'll see you next week on Twitch. I was going to mention, uh, Patrick, when we were talking about, uh, I actually had something cool to mention for uh, what's coming up next week. Not really next week, but we I just ordered in, uh, they were sending me one of those, Puget Systems makes DIY uh, aquarium PCs. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I got that email this morning. I was like, I built one already. I built so one. So they're, they're sending me a kit, and I have to go to, like, I have to go to the farm uh, depot and buy, like, five gallons of mineral oil. I was about to say, try to try to not be in a position where you're running around every, you're hitting every Walmart, 24-hour Walmart and Walgreens yeah. uh, in Kentucky, trying to find enough <laughs> mineral oil to fill that thing. Um, it's fun. It, it was fun. Like his recommendations to me were like, so make sure you use hardware you don't want back when you yeah. test it, because once uh, a motherboard is oily, it will forever be oily. Yes. Um, you know those types of things. Same things yeah. with anything else you put in it. And I, I was kind of disappointed supply. when I heard aquarium. I thought, man, I can actually put fish in it. But not so <laughs> well, you could actually if you built a false wall between the motherboard and the fish, but then you wouldn't have to do all the fancy. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't, that's true. you wouldn't have to do all the fancy. Uh, I don't know. It was, I did it. I wish you luck. Tell me how you enjoy it. Because I ended up. I'll with let like, you know. Yeah, I ended up with like having to take five gallons of mineral oil to the hazmat disposal here in San Francisco because, you know, you don't really want to pour it down the toilet. Um, and no. There's really nowhere else to take it. There's no collection point for mineral oil. I was thinking oil. maybe of making it a set piece behind me or something, put some lights in it. I loved it until the until the uh, power supply died. Um, 
Yeah, yeah that, repair that, and something like that doesn't sound like it'd be very much fun. There let me are reach in there. Things. Let me reach in there and get that power supply. Ugh. One of the three most disgusting moments of my life, adult, <laughs> child, or otherwise, was reaching this into that friggin' five gallons of, of, of mineral oil to pull out that power supply. It's and then you end up you're dripping. You, you put down plastic before you work on it because it's just going to be that messy. Is he is he still around? Is he still around there? there? Hello. So. Uh, what do you want to see on this show in the future? What what kind of segments do you like? What kind of ideas or technologies do you like to see on here? Uh, <laughs> oh, that, yeah. There's that. A bear? <laughs> Monkeys are always good. Well, yeah, we've got we got a monkey back there specifically for that, yeah. Oh, that is true. He's... Yeah, yeah more. The multiplying. <laughs> I don't think he works anymore, though. No. no. Whoa! <laughs> I was in one of those that you, oh, uh, ours there. barely works. Our woot monkey is apparently on the no longer wooty. He's been there for a long time, hadn't he? Was he dusty when you knocked him down? Yeah, actually he was. There's there's kind of crud all over my table now. <laughs> is that one glow in the dark or anything? Apparently John's saying yes. And it, yeah, there you go. That's <laughs> Isn't that the best so sound? A wife hates those things. I hate these things. <laughs> I'm going to aim for the rafters. The thing is, hate those now. You should be in an office when there's five of those things being ripped loose from one end of it to the other. Shooting across. They're pretty dangerous. They could knock over a monitor pretty easily. You can knock an eye out with that thing. You can knock an eye out with that thing. <laughs> I love it when a plane We did find a through. monkey here. So we apparently had multiple loot monkeys. This one works, apparently. <laughs> it's the leopard skin, man. <laughs> yeah, he, he's got a zebra cape on. Zebra cape. Oh, it's black and white. I don't know. A leopard? Is he, is he a snow leopard cape? I don't know. It's from Woot, so whatever. Came in a bag of crap. 